Again, my name is Chris Castro. I'm the, I'm the recently appointed Director of Sustainability for the City of Orlando, uh, helping to run our municipality's efforts on sustainability and resilience. I'm really excited to be here. Um, I am originally from Miami, Florida. I'm a second generation Cuban American. I uh, came up here 10 years ago to study at UCF and dove headfirst into this movement. I've uh, started several organizations, including what's called Ideas for Us, an international NGO working on sustainability projects in about 24 different countries. Uh, and I also have a private firm that I started called Citizen Energy that works on deploying solar and energy efficiency technologies in buildings. Uh, it operates in Washington, D.C. And so I have my hands in a lot of different areas in NGO and private sector now, obviously in, in local government, trying to help shape Orlando as a, as a leading city. Um, just to give you a general overview, this program and, and Orlando's efforts around sustainability really date back to 2007. Uh, Mayor Buddy Dyer was at a conference, a uh, U.S. Conference of Mayors Assembly in Chicago, and at the time, Mayor Daley uh, took all of these mayors around their city hall to show them all of these green renovations that they had made. They incorporated recycling, they had a green roof, they had uh, electric vehicle charging stations, and Mayor Dyer at the time really didn't have a program, an objective to, to do that. And so he came back and assembled a team to really focus on four key objectives. One is preserving natural resources, primarily energy, water, and ecological resources of the city, uh, and ensuring those for long-term sustainability. He also looked at how we could provide tools to our residents and our businesses to incorporate more environmentally friendly business practices and, and lifestyles. What types of things can we do that can really put the tools in the hands of the people and help us reach these goals? Uh, of course, as a, as a government, um, the city's number one goal is enhancing quality of life and reducing pollution impacts on people. And so that's a key objective. And the final one is how can we, in this new industry, create a new economy? How do we drive investments? How do we entice the creative class and businesses to come to our city and really begin to embrace a green economy, new workforce, trainings, and, uh, and spur investments uh, within our city? So we started to look at environmental sustainability in seven key areas, energy and green buildings, local food systems, solid waste innovations, livability, transportation, water, and finally the green economy. How do all of those really drive job creation, economic development, and well-being for, for our people? And so this plan is a visionary document that looks out to the year 2040. You can actually find this plan on our website. It's GreenWorksOrlando.com, and I'll write that up on the board shortly after. Um, but I'm going to touch on a couple of these that, that I felt were creative to, to speak to you about, and then I can uh, take q and I'm really a fan of Q&A and, and I want you all to, to ask questions that you might have. As a brief history, GreenWorks, when it started, um, the cool part about my role, the reason why I actually accepted the offer is because, one, Mayor Dyer is uh, one of the only elected officials really in the Southeast who truly not only values, but prioritizes sustainability. He sees this as the next way to make Orlando a competitive and next-gen city. He wants us to be one of the leading cities in the 21st century. And without that type of leadership and the city council support, you don't see initiatives like this move forward. It, it gets put onto the rug. It becomes a siloed little program on the side just to check a box and say, yeah, we do sustainability. But no, this is a part of the culture of the city. And here I have listed out several departments and divisions throughout the city, from business and facility and financial services, to the economic development, uh, to family parks and recs, to human resources, OF to the Orlando Fire Department, uh, and many others. And the cool thing is I get to work on uh, essentially incorporating all of our sustainability programs in every part of the city's operations and services. Every critical function of the city, I work with the director and the division manager to incorporate this. And, and that's the cool part about it. It's really not a silo program. We've done a lot of a, a lot of different successes uh, from being recognized as a solar America city by the US Department of Energy. Um, we have um, launched what's called Drive Electric Orlando, which is pretty exciting, uh, where we've partnered with the airport and our rent-a-car uh, dealers to offer electric vehicles for people who travel to Orlando. We're, I don't know if you realize, but the number one destination in the country. There are more people who visit Orlando than any other city in the country. 62 million visitors last year alone. And, and so what we did is partnered with the rent-a-car industries and said, hey, you need to start offering electric
electric and at least plug-in hybrid electric vehicles for people who come here so that they can get a test drive of what an EV feels like and also provide some perks and incentives. You get VIP parking at the theme parks, you get free EV charging, you get free parking at your hotels, you get a lot of different accolades just for driving an electric. And of course, uh, studies have shown that those who drive an electric, even as a rental car, oftentimes will change their purchasing habits the next time they go buy a car. Um, and it's somewhere in the 60 to 70% range. So, so we see that as a cool initiative. But you can see a number of other really great things. We're also um, one of the top 10 cities for um, EV ready, what they call EV ready cities, meaning we have more electric vehicles per capita than most cities in the country. I think the last time, hey Charlie, I think the last time we, we met, we, um, we were eighth in the country, and roughly now have 150 EV char public EV charging stations, not including private charging stations. Um, that, that are available. Yes, sir. Are you aware that most of the chargers that don't work are involved with the city of Orlando, the Orange County, and OUC? They're the ones that don't work a lot of times. And no, I'm not, I'm, not aware aware that. Aware. I'm not aware of that. Yeah, although the OUC headquarters is malfunctioning all the time. Yeah. The one at Orange County headquarters does not work for a year. No one cares. Doesn't, there's no one to talk to to fix them. Sure. So it's, talk about all these things that are available are useless because you can't use them when they don't work. Well, I actually used the one at Orange County headquarters the other day, and it worked fine. Well, it didn't yeah, work for the me. The one outside City Hall worked. I mean, we had a complaint recently about the one outside City Hall. We fixed it the and next then, day. And then they, got, they put a bunch in, in downtown near the hospital. You yeah. park there, one guy tells you, you can park there, don't worry about the meter. Next thing you know, you get a ticket, you go to court, you, you find it, you can't get a hold of the guy from the City of Orlando because they don't want to tell you who it was. So it cost me 60 bucks to get a, 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 a 30 cent charge on my car because the right. parking meter guy told me it was okay to park as long as you're charging. So nobody right. knows what's going on. No one's talking to each other. No one knows sure. any clue about what's happening. Yeah, the, the one at the hospital is not the city's uh, well, charging all, station. The, That's the yeah, hospital charging station. The city owns OUC, and they're all run by OUC. Well, the, the city and OUC are two separate government entities. Right, but they can talk to they, each other. And, they work and, together, of course, but it we're... It doesn't we, happen. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, there are obviously some, some inherent challenges uh, with OUC and city and the deployment of EV charging stations, but we do have most of these up and running on the Plug, plug America Cities or the Charge Point app. Yeah. You can see which ones Charge are Point available. app says tell the administrator. The administrator is at the building and they don't have sure. they don't have any interest in fixing it. Well, you can contact me. How about that? And the next time you have a challenge, I'll yeah. make sure that we try to address it. Okay. And it's just very frustrating. You're trying to drive around with the electric car. Yeah. You go to the, uh, the UCF hospital medical place there, out of order. When you're there, you're stuck. Uh, again, that's, that's not City of Orlando's charge. Yeah, so did you contact them, though? Did we're you Once you found OUC. out, it's, did yeah. you contact them? Yeah, did you contact them? When you call OUC, there's no one to Yeah, there's a number right on the station. I call when the phone's not working. Yeah, charge point. And charge point says you call the administrator. There's no one to talk to. There, there's also OUC has an electric vehicle program manager. His name is Sam mm -hmm. Choi, and, and that's probably the. Uh, that's well, Sam Choi would. needs to put his number on all those chargers so someone can talk to Sam. <laughs> yeah, actually, you know, okay. in our subdivision, the street lights all have a unique ID number on it and a phone number to call. So yeah. if the street lights out, you. You don't have Everyone to know else. anything except what's on the plate at the base of the, the street light. Yeah, Call this number. Mm -hmm. This is the ID. You can leave a voicemail, and it's yeah. taken care of. Yeah. So going for just putting a little metal plate on every single one of these, this is the number to call. This is the ID number of it, and that will solve this issue. Well, we'll, we'll make sure to tell OUC that. Um, again, I, I, we don't deploy EV charging stations in the city. We obviously have a municipal utility. provide my contact information if you have any future troubles. So what I wanted to talk to you today about is some initiatives as it relates to energy and green buildings, because we are working on some really exciting things. This is a, a, an image of our um, uh, fire station one in downtown Orlando. It's the first green roof that we installed as uh, on city property. And we're starting to deploy more in those on community centers and, and different areas around the city as well. But um, in terms of energy and green buildings, we have these goals of one, reducing air pollution and, and impact on public health, CO2, etc. We also want to figure out ways to reduce energy use intensity, the amount of energy per square foot per year that's needed to meet our demand of our city. 
and, and through energy efficiency measures, there are, there are amazing technologies out there that a lot of us know about, LEDs, building controls, high efficiency HVAC, that, that can help lower the overall intensity of the energy that we need demanded. Here is a, an interesting chart by the Energy Information Administration, EIA, and it states that U.S. buildings alone use more energy than any country in the world other than China and the United States. So if our buildings were a country, it would be third in line for total energy use worldwide. It is massive. We spend $500 billion a year powering the built environment. And so when we're looking at ways to reduce emissions and reduce energy use intensity, we're looking at our buildings. So is it purpose in that, like government made it so the companies make their money? What's that? Is it purposely that we spend so much? Is it purposefully? I think it, the challenge is, and that I was going to get into, why is the inefficiency? We've done, we've done a 10-year study, and not us, but the American Council on Energy Efficient Economies, ACEEE, and the code, uh, the actual URL at the bottom of the study is there. And what they did is a 10-year study on the U.S. electric grid. What they found is that 86% of the energy that we consume to meet our demand is way 14% is what goes to work to drive industry and manufacturing, to heat and cool our homes, to light these lights in this projector so I can present to you. It's 14%. So if you have 100 tons of coal and we throw 100 tons into the furnace, 86 tons is wasted, 14 tons goes to work. There's a huge problem in this country with inefficiency, not just in energy, but food and waste, etc. right? We're, we're very gluttonous and we need to improve our efficiency. So we started to look at our own municipal operations. We have roughly 6.8 million square feet in the city of Orlando that we own and operate as the city, uh, about 550 buildings. And what we did was we decided to take out a municipal green bond of $17.5 million. And the reason why we did this is we, we put all of those buildings into a system called Energy Star Portfolio Manager. This is an incredible free tool that's provided for businesses to essentially put a miles per gallon on your building. You can put a 1 to 100 score of how efficient your building uses energy and water compared to other facilities around the same climate region, same size, the same use. And so this tool, we plugged all of our buildings in and it showed us the bottom 55 most energy intensive buildings. The buildings are using more energy per square foot than these other more efficient ones. So we took $17.5 million and we're in the process of deploying energy efficiency technologies and renovations to improve the efficiency of these buildings. By deploying these, we, were, we are on track to save $2.4 million per year that we're normally being using taxpayer dollars to essentially pay for utilities and are now being redeployed in a revolving loan fund, a revolving energy fund, so we can take the savings and keep improving our buildings and take those savings and keep improving the buildings over and over and over again. Um, the Amway Arena, is one of these buildings that the city, believe it or not, owns, owns but does not operate. Right? We have a third party operator, but we own that building. It's Lead Gold, it was built in 2000, uh, 2010. And uh, just the high intensity sports lighting inside of the arena, we switched out to LED as of last month. 100% LED now, we're one of the only arenas in the country that are lit by LED. And, and we're now doing the non-intensive sports lighting and all the concourses, the bathrooms, the offices, when we retrofit the whole Amway, just the lighting will save $300,000 a year. Just in the lighting costs. And so you're talking huge amounts of waste and improvements that we could be making, and now multiply that across the entire city, right? Is that net saving or gross savings? Net savings. Wow. Yes, $300,000 net savings. So we're also doing renovations to our city hall. City hall has been uh, outdated, and so we're upgrading the lighting systems, building controls inside of that. And so, um, and then community centers. Here's mm -hmm. a Dover Shores Community Center in District 2, Tony Ortiz's district. We um, have retrofitted all of the lighting inside, interior and exterior, and put controls. And just those two investments have saved 25% of the baseline from the year before. And we're saving $17,000 a year in this small little community center, um, which again, starts to add up over time. This is a big deal. That does not include a solar thermal renovation that we made uh, to heat the pool. And we, we actually took 96 kW of electric heat that was heating the pool, and we put two flat plate solar collectors, four by tens, and a backup six kW heater, 
And in seven months, we got a return on investment in that project. That's like 10 houses. It's incredible. Yeah, 96 kW, right? It's an incredible amount of heat. And we were like, why? The demand charge alone, saving 96 to 6, 90 kW, return on investment was so quick. You had a quick question. Yeah, the last slide you showed the city of Paul. Yep. You said it's updated, needs to be updated. It is currently being updated as we speak. And how bad is it? What do you mean? <laughs> I mean, how much? How much does it cost to fix it? What's how, how bad is it? How bad is it? We, we're in the process. That um, out of the 17.5, I believe it's roughly three or four million dollars that's going to the city hall. Yeah. That would take all of the lighting to LED. It's also taking the elevators and renovating those. Um, they'll, they'll have three gen motors in them. The two of them have been replaced. Other two are being in the works. We're putting uh, sophisticated building controls inside. So in real time, we'll be able to not only control HVAC per floor, but we'll be able to control lighting uh, in, in and after hours. Um, and uh, we are replacing uh, part of the roof to a cool roof, so reflective roofing technology. You're talking about the roof that you'll see? Correct. Okay. Yeah, there's a, there's, a, there's a part of the flat roof on the back of City Hall that, that is uh, needing to be replaced. Do you know how big the energy storage is? We don't have any storage on site at City Hall. No. Energy storage? Uh, no, battery backup? No. no. It sounded like you were saying that they do. Right? No, we don't have any storage at this site. We are testing storage at another site that I have to get into, but, but at City Hall, we don't have any storage. You said regen. Regen motors are uh, in the in the elevator shaft, so as you're going down, do a regen motor just so you, you actually make power to put it into the grid. Right the Correct, it goes right into the grid. Yep. So, so Derby Shore, City Hall, Amway, these are examples of buildings that we're using this funding for. And again, it's a bond, so we've taken out, we've borrowed money, risked our own bond capital, and we're deploying it in technology that we know is going to have savings, and we're repaying the bond through the savings and taking a portion of it and recycling it, which is, which is the exciting part. Um, we have worked with OUC to start providing tools to residents. And if you're a city or OUC customer, there is a program called Efficiency Delivered energy assessment of your home. So they come out, you schedule a time for them to come out, they do a full assessment of your house, and then they give $2,000 to the homeowner to make improvements, primarily weatherization, lighting, things of that nature, and then you can repay the $2,000 on your bill, so on bill financing. This is a really creative mechanism to take out the upfront cost of a homeowner to, to make those improvements. Sometimes we don't have the spare capital, 2000 or you can't go get a second mortgage or whatever, and instead the utility will provide that for you. They also subsidize it based on household income. So if you're under $40,000 as a household income, they'll give you 85% of the $2,000 free of charge. You, you only pay $300 of the $2,000. If you're between 40 and 60%, they give you 50% of that $2,000, so, so you only pay back 1,000, and if you're above the 60, then you only get the rebates. This is a creative program we're trying to expand to the commercial entities because commercial buildings are the largest users, and I'll get into how we're going to work with them. Are you get Duke to do this too? Duke. <laughs> yeah. 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 Private companies hate efficiency because <laughs> it's making their – that's like paying a grocery store to figure out how to get you to eat less. Yeah. <laughs> well, yes and no. I mean, if there is an incentive for companies to save, though, even Duke Energy, and that is avoid a cost. They have to spend more money, especially in peak time. Sometimes it's three and four times per kilowatt hour that they have to purchase a wheel from another power plant in order to meet the demand. And they're rewarded for that. Their profits no, are set no, out of the percentage of their costs. No, they're not. They will tell you straight up, they're spending 25 cents a kilowatt hour sometimes to meet peak demand, and they're only selling it to you at 10. So they're spending 15 cents more per kilowatt hour at peak times. So so what the goal is, is to for them at least, not say extreme amounts, but they want to make sure that they're not hitting above peak because then they're off peaker pants, they have to they have to wheel power and, and that costs them more, which is why OUC is really interested in, in saving energy as well. Um, so so it's a balance. Self is another loan product that we brought to it started in St. Lucie County. We now offer it in Orlando. It's a, a loan product you can get up to um, up to fifty thousand dollars for a loan for your house to make improvements uh, it could be energy efficiency, it could be water efficiency, it could be new roof, it could be solar. And 
data, and the goal is to really target low and moderate income communities. So 70% of the money that SELF provides as a nonprofit has to go to LMI census districts uh, throughout the city, and they, uh, as a, a way to support LMI districts, their credit score can be as low as 580, so they can have a fairly low credit score um, and still get access to this money, whereas if you go to a regular bank, they're not able they're gonna blast you out the door, essentially, uh, if you're trying to get a loan for that. So we're trying to offer tools, again, to residents, even those that are uh, less financially, that are more financially constrained to get these uh, resources. And the last exciting financial tool I'll mention is PACE financing. This is a really, really good program for Orlando. Property Assessed Clean Energy. Um, there are essentially uh, what PACE provides is another mechanism to get 100% of the money to make improvements to your house or your building. And instead of it being a loan where you're paying back monthly, it becomes a property assessment that you pay back on your property taxes every year. So once a year payment on non ad valorem assessments. And essentially, uh, you know, you as a customer contact a PACE agency in Orlando, which we have three, I'll mention them. They'll give you 100% of the money and you as a customer will hire a roofing contractor and an AC unit and a solar company and you bundle it for years. So you can take this, and I'll give an example here. You have $108,895 is a real world example, commercial building. They had 7% interest, there's interest on the money. It was a 10 year term. They decided to stretch out the money for 10 years with 7% interest. Their annual payment to pay back the 108 was 15,520. But because they made the renovations for their lighting and things like that, they saved 20% of their energy, which is roughly $50,000. And because of that, their net savings over a year was $34,000. So your cash flow from day one by using PACE and stretching it out over time and then paying once a, once a year on your property tax roll. Really creative tool that can help solar cooperatives in order to make this thing happen. You can do a PACE for solar cooperatives. So a homeowner can say, I want to go solar with the cooperative, get a lower cost per watt installed, plus I tap into this financing. Now it's a no brain. Now it's a win-win all the way around. And who's eligible for this? Any homeowner or business owner. So it's both commercial and residential. And so this is a massive amount. There's $500 million of capital between these three agencies. Think of these as banks. These three entities here, Renew Pace, Evest, and Wygreen Works. These are, bank, these are entities that provide the capital and they walk you through the process of getting this money. Um, we, we decided most cities will enter into one of these and they'll monopolize the marketplace for one of those banks. We decided, you know what, why not create a competitive marketplace? It'll help the end user with fees and rates at the end of the day, let them compete for the market. And, and that's what we've done, but we're one of the first cities in, in the state to do this type of model. Um, so this is coming, it's really available now, but it's not going to be started to be marketed until October. We're working on fact sheets, we're working on a website, and so you'll start seeing more information from OUC and, and others about PACE here very soon. The last thing on energy I want to mention is I was hired originally by Mayor Dyer to, to develop a policy two and a half years ago. It's taken two and a half years to, to bring this forward. And the policy is around providing our residents and our businesses with more about how our buildings use energy and water resources. We can't effectively manage what we're not measuring, right? Mm -hmm. And if we can't see what we're measuring and how we're performing, how are we expected to improve is the question. So if you go to a car lot to buy a new car, if you're a National Driver Electric Group, right? There's an MPG rating on these cars. You can make a determination of how far you're gonna go on a gallon of gas or a kilowatt hour. If you go to a grocery store, you have nutritional facts on food people can now make an informed decision about what they want to eat, put in their body. Sort of. Sort of. <laughs> if you go to buy a new appliance, now you have this energy gauge, right? And you can yeah. see on average how much you're going to spend over a year. Well, now cities are beginning to see that buildings are the largest consumer of energy and water in the city, especially large buildings, and they're the greatest contributor to carbon emissions and air pollution. In Orlando, 70% of our greenhouse gas emissions are buildings using energy. And the largest buildings are half of it. 50,000 square feet and above are half of the emissions, half of the energy and water use. So the way that we're moving forward with this policy 
and many cities have done this now, is to require that the largest buildings in our cities use a tool to rate themselves, get them miles per gallon for how efficient your building is, like we did in the city. Remember I mentioned Energy Star, Portfolio Minute? That's the tool that we're requiring. It's free, it's web-based, the, the buildings step on the scale, they report the information, and they make it available to the public. So now when you go to rent an apartment, or a business wants to occupy a tenant space in downtown, you're able to see not only the cost to rent, but the overall cost of utilities as well, and how efficient this building is. What that does is it creates a cycle of improvement. This building that's a 20, sees its competitor that's a 60, and they say, how do I lower my cost so I can attract more tenants? What can I do? I get an audit. Maybe it's the lighting. Where am I going to get the money? Pace, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So we have this cycle of improvement to get people to start paying attention to efficiency. Um, that's a really exciting initiative. It goes to City Council on the 15th for the first read, on the 26th for the second read. We have a number of people who are going to come out to publicly testify and support. We have some who are in opposition, but we feel that this is the right thing to do, um, and it's going to be one of the biggest climate and energy policies ever see the city's history, and, and I'm excited to bring it forward. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to touch on a couple of other cool things that are happening in Orlando regarding food. Uh, local food systems are really coming up as uh, a priority for our community, and, and when we surveyed our community about the seven areas, local food came up on the top of the list. So um, as part of our plan, we started to do an analysis of our neighborhoods, and we wanted to identify the areas that were within a half mile of a food source, whether it's a grocery store, fruit and vegetable market, or a farmer's market. And we identified areas that were outside of a half mile. So everything in orange is what's considered a food insecure neighborhood, sometimes called a food desert. And we are in the process of attacking this problem by expanding community gardens and urban farming programs, as well as farmer's markets in these specific areas so that we can start to tackle that problem. Right now we have 11 existing community gardens throughout the city of Orlando. Here are some of the major neighborhoods from Festival Park, Colonial Town, Paramore, Dover Shores, Rock Lake. These two are the newest ones we just installed. And these are opportunities for homeowners to rent out a plot, as you know about community gardens. They do their own farming, they uh, produce the, the produce, and they take that back home. There's no exchange or, or revenue generation that comes from community gardens. Are you going to add on? Oh, we're going to continue to add. In fact, um, I'll get to that in a second here. In addition to just the gar helping to build the gardens, our office, my office, helps to organize and provide educational opportunities for the garden committees. Each garden has a committee, has a president and a secretary. They have their own organization. And so we have a leadership committee where each individual garden has a representative and we meet quarterly. We also have an advisory board. Uh, led by Robert Bowden from Blue Gardens. He's our executive director at Blue Gardens, amazing gentleman. He's written books on gardening in, in Florida and uh, just an amazing guy. So Is the land usually donated? The la it's usually on public land at a community center. We have one private land, which is the Washington Shores. This is on somebody's private land, and the city decided to do what's called a conditional use permit. So we changed the, the zoning, essentially, for that particular site to agriculture, because it wasn't, it was residential. Mm -hmm. It was a CUP, a conditional use permit. We went through council, they approved it, now we have a community garden there for them. But most of these are at community centers or on public land. Yes? Um, Pine Hills, is that, um, does that have a community garden anywhere near? I doubt it. No, actually it doesn't. Um, no. We are looking to work on, so Pine Hills is southwest mm -hmm. uh, Orlando, to my understanding, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. By Metro West, almost this general vicinity, um, and no, there's not one, but we're looking to expand. No. Here's the Dover Shores he's Community Center. The city of Orlando. Yeah, I know. He's concerned at the border of the city. Partnership with Orlando can. City Soccer, so then. really targeting some of those low-income areas. And the two that we're replacing, one is at Lake Eola Heights, District 2, and also yeah. Lake Druid yeah. Park, um, by Audubon, Coy Town. Mm -hmm. uh, at Lake Druid Park, that's going to be the largest community garden we have, over 50. The other unique thing about Orlando that most cities don't have is we have a distinct landscape code that allows homeowners 
to grow food on their lawns, front yard gardens specifically. Uh, this happened because in 2012, there was a homeowner in College Park that had a garden, and it was controversial. There was residents and neighbors who didn't like it, and some who really did, and it went all the way up to the New York Times. There was an article in the New York Times about this homeowner. Well, the commissioner at the time said, we need to do something about it, let's go to planning. We started to do research, and we said, well, let's amend the landscape code to allow for a certain percentage to be grown for edible landscape. And that's exactly what happened. 60% of your front lawn, if you live in the city, can be used for edible landscape. You can have wow, literally that's growth great. of organic farming on your front lawn. That's somebody's front lawn next to their road. There's an organization that I'm a part of called Fleet Farming that started here in Orlando and took advantage of this landscape code revision and now provides a unique opportunity for homeowners to grow food without any input. So they literally enter into an agreement, Fleet Farming comes in, builds it, maintains it, and then they share crops. So a portion, 10% of what we grow on their land goes to the homeowner every single week. 90% is processed and sold to restaurants, farmers markets, and food trucks. So now we're using wasted space it really is adding to the problem, because all we do is throw fertilizer on the lawn, mm -hmm. and it rains, it runs mm -hmm. off, it creates algae blooms, right? All these problems that we have. Well, instead, why not put it into production and start growing food? And that's exactly what this organization has done. So really exciting. Check out fleetfarming.com for more information about that, that group. We also have identified about 20 acres, 20 to 25 acres of public land, city owned land, not going to be developed for the next five to ten years. And so I approached the planning department and said, well, how can we activate this space and utilize it? How can we allow nonprofits to take it out and start for a short-term lease growing food? It helps us reach our goals for DreamWorks. So we did that. We piloted this in Paramore. There's a quarter acre on South Street that we got a conditional use permit through planning. And there's a nonprofit called the Growing Orlando that works in that community to essentially as a market garden, they're, they're making produce, they're selling it. So this is a revenue opportunity for them. And um, it's really exciting to see where they've, where they've gone um, with this whole initiative. I hope that after a year, we're gonna revisit, and the hope is to expand upon this. And they're getting it for $1 per acre per year, mm -hmm. essentially the agreement. So if you have a five acre plot, you five bucks per year to essentially have the entire five acres and for a short term, we're able to do that to, to help us meet our demand. We have a vision of basically being spring training for farming. Our season for growing food is in the fall, winter, and spring. Most people are in snow. So imagine people flying into Orlando, visiting these urban farms, participating in them, and then taking those skills back home when it's ready and you know, allowing us to be that incubator. That's a vision that, that I think we want to achieve. So the last um, key area that ties into this whole mix is our solid waste. And I'll mention that the city uh, has an in-house solid waste program. So we own the trucks, we own the carts, and we also do the collection for residential and commercial. Most cities will third-party contract for that service, but it's an enterprise fund for us. We actually make revenue as a city doing this. Um, first, I'll mention that our fleet is in the process of transitioning to 100% alternative fuel vehicles. By 2030, every single vehicle in the city's fleet will be alternative fuel. That doesn't mean all electric. That means there'll be CNG, there'll be hybrids, hybrid electric, or all electric. So right now, all the garbage trucks on the road for residential are hydraulic hybrids. Who can guess what the miles per gallon is for a regular garbage truck? Mm. Three, Five, four, one. I heard close to yeah. in between one and three. Wow. Like two. Yeah. Is really our activity. <laughs> Two miles to the gallon, right? Um, hydraulic hybrid bumps you up to a whopping 4.5. <laughs> so now we double. And if we move to CNG, which in the process of the next five years we'll be moving to all compressed natural gas vehicles, we'll get to eight MPG equivalent. So these trucks are intensive, they're large, they're heavy, they don't have a lot of efficiency to them, but we are trying to switch the fuels to more cleaner and more efficient. Um, so that's first and foremost. We also have this goal, extremely ambitious goal of being zero waste for the city of Orlando. Mm -hmm. When I sat down with Mayor going through this plan, I said, this is probably the most ambitious goal we have in this plan. 
We are a growing city. We're one of the fastest growing cities in the country. And we're expected to, by 2040, have diverted 100% of our waste. That's, uh, that's huge, right? Right now, we're at about 27 to 30% diversion rate. That's excellent. So from recycling, about a third of the waste that we're producing is being diverted from the landfill. And our goal is to get to 50% in the next two years. How we're going to do that, here is, of course, a picture of our wonderful Orange County landfill that, that we dump everything into. So the city pays the county the tip, $33.50 per ton, into the landfill. So we spend taxpayer dollars to get rid of our waste. So there's a financial incentive for us to divert that because we'll pay less. When you go to the recycling mark, you actually don't have a tipping fee. So there's zero dollars for us to tip recyclables to the MERC but it's $33.50 to tip it into the landfill. So What's now that the, the, sorry, mixed re, uh, recycling facility. Uh -huh. So it's, it's, it's a processing facility for recycling. Has that grown? Is there a more being recycled? Is there a bigger area to recycle? We're starting to grow that. Okay. Here's actually a, an image of our MERC, the materials recovery facility, yeah. that you have your tipping floor where all of the base recyclables go into. There's a group of manual sorters they'll go and manually sort out some of the major things. There's a star screener that helps to bundle up things that are smaller, like smaller bottles. The challenge is, is plastic bags get mixed up into the star screener and they'll clog it up. And so plastic bags are not able to be recycled. That's something to note. If you're putting recycling in a plastic bag, mm -hmm. stop doing that if you can. I put it into a paper bag or I just use a tote bag and I put my recyclables in and I just dump the tote bag instead of putting it into a plastic bag because at the MERV, it'll get cut, but it'll get s spun up into the star screeners and it clogs and makes a nightmare mess mm -hmm. for the recycling facility. There's also optical sorting, uh, fiber lines, so another manual sort, and then finally a bale link. And once it's bailed, that's how the recycling company can sell it and ship it out. So that's kind of how recyclables happens really quickly. Yes? Um, how should we recycle plastic bags then? So in order to not clog it? Unfortunately, plastic bags can't be recycled currently. But I will mention that we are speaking with a company that's looking to come to Orlando that is trying to convert plastics and policy.